You can start, Dan. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. My name is Dan Silverman. I am the Assistant Director of WCET's State Authorization Network. Thank you all for making some time for the January 2021 SAN Coordinator Call. We have extra special guests today, both in the audience and as a present and the presenters. And we will get to those presentations very soon. First, I would like to start by welcoming the new SAN coordinators. As always, hold your applause till the end. From The Ohio State University, we have Justin Weimer, Joanna Schmidt, TCU, Kelly Trahan from Lehigh Carbon Community College, Caroline Kobeck Pesarosi from Gallaudet, Leah Reiner from Mech, Amelia Pfeiffer, Boise State, Thomas Scott, North Idaho College, Heather Walker from Digitex. Welcome to you all. Cheryl, over to you. Thanks very much, Dan. Uh, it was great uh, to have Dan start us off. Uh, as you heard, he is the Assistant Director for the WCET State Authorization Network. I am the Director for the State Authorization Network, and we're very pleased that we have um, additional folks joining us today. We had asked our coordinators, because we have these monthly coordinator calls, we had asked our coordinators if they would like to invite a senior leader uh, to be able to attend with them so that they can see a little bit more about our organization and also hear our uh, speakers for today. I'm going to start a, first with a little bit of a recap from our last meeting. Um, as many of you know, uh, we have uh, been holding an in-person um, meeting for SAN coordinators in conjunction with the WCET annual meeting for the last many falls. Um, but unfortunately, uh, due to the pandemic, we were not able to meet in person just this past fall. The WCET annual meeting was virtual, as was our coordinator meeting. So what we did instead was we did a 90-minute call. Uh, we used Zoom meeting, and we um, provided for more opportunity to have interactions and also a special guest and gave a state of the network is what I've called it the last few years. And all of this is archived on the SAN uh, website. You can look on the SAN website and see the information from our last coordinator meeting. So it was in place of our annual meeting. So it was a, um, a little bit more built up um, uh, agenda. We had a welcome address from our um, executive director, Russ Poulin, and we had uh, the state of the network, which I indicated was a very long list of the things that we've accomplished as a network in this past year and some things we're looking forward to. Items include white papers that we've either uh, newly developed or revised, uh, charting other tools. Um, we had a new um, professional licensure handbook that we shared, and uh, we've also um, created some new events. We had a basics workshop that was virtual last fall, and we're working on the advanced topics workshop that will be this spring, which we'll talk about a little bit later. We also had a special speaker. We had Aaron Lacey from Thompson Coborn, who talked a little bit about reflections on the election and the impact on higher education. And one of the things that I was most pleased about was our interactive piece, where we broke into small groups and the members were able to communicate with each other about some of the strategies that they're doing around certain compliance issues at their institution. So we always gain a lot from our ability to interact with our other members. So that was uh, a recap, and you can see all of that, including the recording and transcript uh, from that meeting, um, are posted on the SAN website. So without further ado, I am very excited about these special guests that we have today. Our first special guest is Karen Solomon. She is the Vice President for Accreditation Relations and Director um, for Standard Pathway with the Higher Learning Commission. She joined the Higher Learning Commission in 2003 and serves as Vice President and Chief Transformation Officer. Since 2016, she has been leading HLC's future-focused grant initiatives on innovation, student success, and quality awareness. Dr. Solomon presently serves as Public Representative for the Council for the Advancement of Standards in Higher Education, CAS, and is past chair of the WCET Executive Council. Previously, Dr. Solomon was the founding executive director of Illinois Campus Compact 
and served in various roles at ACT and higher education institutions. She holds an EDD in adult and continuing education from Northern Illinois University with a focus on adult learners and educational technology. Karen, we are so pleased that you could be with us. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you, Cheryl. I can share my screen or sh allow you to share. Why don't you go ahead and share your screen? You want me to run them? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, folks, right. I did a uh, Mac OS update uh, yesterday and all the settings are all messed up. So I'm having a hard time sharing today. So Cheryl's graciously uh, taken over the slides and we'll populate them here in a moment. Okay. I'm gonna first start talking about um, what we did in the spring of 2020. Uh, when the pandemic first started to um, really move onto our radar screen. Uh, we were in the midst of a very active time at the agency when we were actually had teams out visiting campuses, doing evaluation reviews and things like that. Um, and we ended up pivoting um, pretty quickly on that. The Department of Ed's guidance came down, allowed for interruptions of study um, and temporary flexibilities and things like that. Um, and that's what we ended up doing. Within a matter of about a week, we shifted many of our protocols and how we evaluate um, institutions during this time. So we needed to triage our agency in order to ensure business continuity. Um, that impacted the accreditation activities, our evaluation procedures, and our operations overall. We were going to have a test uh, work at home day on March 13th, primarily for those that are always working in the office. And it was the day that we were, everybody was gonna be out of the office. We were gonna see how it worked. And we've never been back. Um, our office has been closed. Only a few people are allowed in at a time, um, even if they need to go in there. So we've been working remotely this entire time. Uh, so we also needed to focus on our operations. So we shifted based on the um, flexibilities that were granted by the department to continue the evaluations of institutions against our criteria for accreditation, but in a virtual space. And for those spring visits, we also then uh, developed a um, verification visit that would be held in the fall. Because at that time we thought, oh, of course we'll be back to work in the fall. Um, so we had that two part process. Um, and so we held the virtual evaluations. We encouraged institutions to use their technology and have our peer reviewers logging in through their technology and conducting the interviews. Um, our, our our system is cloud-based, and so they could still access all the materials that they needed to access and review all those materials and things like that. In the fall, those verification visits occurred, um, and that closed out our spring evaluations. But in the fall, for our fall ev for evaluations, we actually identified a peer reviewer in the state where the institution was housed or located. Um, so that peer reviewer could drive from their home to that campus spends part of the day on the campus while the rest of the team was virtual um, and then could go home that night. So we didn't have airfare, we didn't have hotel issues, we didn't have quarantine issues or anything else like that. We also had some opportunity for our institutions to make some changes and the department's uh, flexibilities allowed us to grant distance education waivers for about 160 of our institutions that didn't have full distance education approval. Um, this allowed them to keep their continuity, keep their students enrolled and things like that. Um, that waiver was extended by the department through the end of um, 2020, and we allowed our institutions to do that. But in, to, in, um, to have that waiver for the fall term, they actually had to complete quite a bit of information about what they'd been doing to develop their faculty, provide the technical assistance and things like that, so that we would grant that continued waiver over the fall term. Uh, in the summer of 2020, we made the determination we were not going to extend a waiver at past December, even if the department allowed for that. Uh, so any institution that wanted to continue offering distance education now in 2021 had to submit an application and go through our regular substantive change process. Um, and institutions were all expected to notify us on a regular basis of changes in the institutional operations, whether the term uh, was um, changed and, and um, spring break was canceled so they could get students out uh, off the way from the campus sooner or things like that, or they changed their modalities all those types of notifications. So we had 100% of our membership keeping us informed um, and the collection of data is incredible to see the transformations our institutions went through. 
Um, we actually continue our evaluations um, and our institutions in the fall were asked to write a report to supplement their criteria um, filing that explained their COVID-19 response. And so that became another element for our peer reviewers to understand how the institution was functioning during this time um, and what was definitely not normal um, and what the institution's plans were to maintain quality throughout this time. And the virtual evaluations have gone really well. Um, our peer reviewers and our institutions have saying they felt that they had the same type of interaction they've been used to. They just didn't get the, the opportunity to have those you know, side conversations that you would have when you're sitting next, on a table next to somebody, you know, waiting for a meeting to begin or things like that. Um, we did delay a few evaluations because of extenuating circumstances. Maybe it was an institution coming up for candidacy or an institution on a sanction or things like that. And we decided we wanted to have more engagement between the institution and the peer reviewers um, at that point. Next slide, please. One of the questions that um, came up here was about uh, regulatory update and what, what is HLC doing with some of the new regulations that have gone into effect. So as you know, for over 120, for 125 years, we've accredited colleges and uni universities and we've grown to a 19 state region. Um, we are no longer known as a regional accrediting agency. Uh, the regulations changed that. We are now known as an institutional accreditor. There is no national uh, regional distinction anymore. Uh, we were now known as an historically regional accreditor um, from that standpoint. Our bylaws define our scope of operation to that 19 state region. And the new regulations that went into effect in July 2020 allows for uh, agencies such as ours to actually expand the scope or um, tighten the scope if they chose, choose to do so. Some of the other formerly regional accrediting agencies have changed their scope and broadened that. Um, we would have to go through a series of policy um, changes for that to occur. And our board of trustees has not taken that on yet. So at this point in time, we're still a 19 state um, accrediting agency, though we have um, locations across um, the country, except for three states, and we're in 163 international locations. So um, that's where we sit as a regional accrediting agency at this point in time. What's interesting about this is that stripping away the title of regional accrediting, accreditation or accrediting agencies or things like that has a ripple effect um, in so many different ways. Many institutions have transfer policies that limit the transfer of credit only from regional accrediting agencies. Um, there are admissions policies that may need to be adapted and things like that. But it also goes on outside of the institution and the higher education realm into organizations such as licensing bodies and state statutes and things like that. So this will be a ripple that will be felt for quite some time as um, all these changes need to be made um, throughout this whole ecosystem of which, at which we operate. Um, next slide, please, Cheryl. Let's talk a little bit more about the regulatory updates, some of the new regulations that are out and things like that. Um, with a real emphasis on substantive change. It's really, really want to focus here on um, many of the new regulations require just notification or maybe approval. Um, in, we now must consider the institution's financial and administrative capacity in a much deeper way um, than was done before. So we've modified our um, applications and, and things like that. And there are more limitations on institutions that are placed on, on sanction after July 1st. And even when they're removed from sanction, there's an additional three year period of which they must go through a, a much higher level of approval process, um, which is going to be interesting for, for many of those institutions. Um, and it requires more institutions to develop teach out plans. I'm gonna spend some time at the end talking about teach out plans. Next slide, please. So there are certain programs that now require, program level changes that now require notification or maybe approval um, within, notification within 30 days of starting that. One would be changing the um, existing program's method of delivery. Even though an institution may have approval to offer distance education programs in plural and doesn't have any limitations on that, now must notify the agency every time you move a program to a different modality. Um, that's, a, that's a significant shift because many of our institutions were under that understanding that they had sort of an umbrella um, stipulation. Well, now there needs, there's more active reporting taking place. And within 30 days, that's the big shift. Um, it's not once a year at the time of the institutional update, it's really on an ongoing basis. So 
our accreditation liaison officers that are at each institution are going to have to really um, explain and educate to folks across their institution what um, needs to be reported to the agency and how they can keep gathering that information. Another one is an aggregate change of 25% or more of the clock hours, credit hours, or content of a program um, since, the, uh, since the most recent accreditation review. Once again, another big shift um, in terms of regulation and oversight and reporting required. Um, and the development of customized pathways or abbreviated modified courses and close um, um, to accommodate existing knowledge and can close competency gaps between the prior knowledge and the full requirement of the particular program. And then lastly, contractual arrangements. That has changed also. Okay. Um, so substantive change, quite a bit of change here. A um, lot more reporting by the institutions. You're really going to have to focus on a stream of, of continual reporting within your institution so that accreditation liaison officer um, can keep reporting to HLC on a timely, on a timely manner. Um, some of the other change, a substantive change that's taken place um, actually has to do with um, the, not only the type of reporting, um, but the, the way that um, institutions actually have to prepare in case there may be some disruption. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk a bit about here about teach out. Um, teach out is when circumstances triggering teach out obligations, um, maybe you know, there's a a disruption or there's a potential disruption for students to have the ability to complete their programs of study in which they're enrolled. Um, federal, re federal regulations require a teach out plan as a written plan as far as that goes. What's interesting and what's changed in the regulations is that some institutions now may be required to develop a plan even though they don't feel they have the potential um, to disrupt that student's ability uh, to complete the programs of study for, in which they enrolled. Um, but it's now a requirement in the regulations. One of these is if an institution is placed on heightened cash management by the department, um, that institution must now create a written teach out plan, identifying um, what students, where they are in their academic programs, which are probably going to be most likely um, to be graduating within typically one year of the academic program so that they actually would um, be part of that teach out plan um, and also to consider um, what the communication plan would be for students, how to get that information, what are the different programs of study, what are other institutions that have similar programs of study that would not cause an undue burden on that student to transition to another institution. Um, so the reason I bring this up is important because I think many of our institutions, A, may have to start to create plans or B, may be asked to, come to work with that institution that has to create that plan um, to be a partner in that. Next slide, please. And so we're gonna talk a real briefly here about a couple of things. One, teach out arrangements. That's when the institution has to create that plan. Um, and it's a written plan that provides for that equitable treatment of students. Um, if an institution or a location that provides 100% of at least one program ceases to operate or plans to cease operations before all the students have completed. Um, this is where you really need to block out, know where your student population is, know what programs they're enrolled in, all those types of things. How many credits have they earned? Um, this takes some time um, for institutions to gather this information and then actually do a, a deep dive in terms of where are the other institutions um, that have similar programs? Are they located nearby? Do they have some different modality options and things like that? Um, this is challenging, especially for institutions that feel they're going to keep operating um, going forward, but they've been triggered because of some of the um, requirements in the regulations. Institutions that are also placed on sanction um, must create the plan. Next, there would be a teach out agreements. These are when uh, this, this institution that must create the plan is required in some way, in some forms or reasons, to actually build signed agreements with teach out receiving institutions. These are institutions that have agreed um, to bring on those students, um, not disrupt their, their time to completion. That's typically meaning that they're waiving some of the residency requirements um, or some of the courses that they would have expected students to um, take the, the, the new institutions, similar type of course. It really allows the students to stay on that trajectory to complete and move forward with their life. 
Um, so the teach out or receiving institutions make that commitment. Um, and we've created a new um, guidance document called a teach out toolkit um, with some funding from Lumina Foundation to support us on this, to really help both those closing institutions and or potentially closing institutions and the receiving institutions to think through all and be aware of all of the different steps they need to take, all of the different issues that they need to address and things like that. Um, that was created with a great work group of, of folks from institutions and state agencies that have been involved in these types of activities. Um, and it just came out this fall, um, but I put the URL in here if you need to reference that. Now, if an institution isn't going to be that teach out receiving institution, but still willing to work with students, that would go through your typical transfer process. Uh, where students would apply to the institution, they would have their credits analyzed and things like that, and then make a determination going forward. So that's all I have for right now. I know our time is tight this afternoon, um, but Cheryl, I'll turn it back over to you. Cheryl? Yeah, I'm one of them too. I yeah. start talking before I take myself off. Um, I apologize that I jumped to the questions, uh, but as you were finishing up your last statement, um, I was trying to see if I could somehow highlight your um, your URL to put in the chat, but I'll share it with everybody later, so that's no problem. But uh, thank you very much for this, folks. If you you have this opportunity to um, have Karen um, address your questions, if you would like to put your questions into the chat. Um, you know, Karen has graciously offered to uh, answer your questions. So, um, you know, this is available to you, or if you are, are willing, take yourself off mute. Um, I know some of our folks are, are less shy um, and uh, may be willing to take themselves off mute. Oh, thanks, Karen, for putting the URL on there. That's great. Um, what questions do you all have for Karen? Uh, she's outlined for us you know, many of the things that we need to be aware of um, from some regulatory changes um, and other high priorities um, for, um, for, uh, for accreditation. So let's see, oh, here we go. Are we expected to have a teach out policy in place or does this just come into play if we are in that situation? Um, I think this is a really good planning practice for an institution to be aware of if things change. And we've seen a lot of institutions, um, the financial stability really get rocked during this pandemic. Um, and and um, folks are realizing things can turn on a dime. Um, to have that plan or, or at least the shell of a plan, I think is a really wise um, planning piece for the institution. Just like you have a master facility plan, emergency preparedness plan and things like that. That was a good question. Thank you for that. Um, let's see. Does HLC share with state regulators when they receive an institutional teach out plan on design, uh, as designated under the new regulations? Um, it depends on where the uh, where the instance is that where the plan is required um, as far as that goes. So we don't necessarily share the plan. But if an institution, say, is placed on probation, um, that institutional action letter that goes to the institution also goes to the state agency, goes to the Department of Education and things like that. And it calls out that the institution must create this provisional plan, as we call it. Um, don't need signed agreements necessarily all the time, but you at least need the structure of the plan. Um, some of the state agencies may have regulations that require um, that if you, have, if you have to submit something in during a sanction period to your accrediting agency, you also need to submit it to their office. So it's something to be familiar with for each state. Great, okay. Um, regarding removal of regional accreditors from the regulations and the fact that there's no longer a distinction, is there any concern should an institution simply elect to recognize certain uh, accreditors and list the seven formal regional accreditors as those recognized? So it's, up to, it's going to be up to institutions to make their just determination of how they want to, um, what type of accrediting agency they want to work with um, and be engaged with. And I think, um, you know, I think we'll have a very different conversation in a year or two from now. I think we're in the very early stages and it's going to be difficult to predict on that one. Are you seeing differences in how the different accrediting agencies are handling what you have covered? Differences in extended waivers or in teach out practices? Absolutely, um, each agency has its own culture um, built within the membership and things like that. And so um, the agency really works through their um, governing board and the governing boards may take different focus or the staff may take a different focus. And that's, and that's historically been 
Um, we're sim we've been similar in some ways, but also different. What kind of contractual agreements must be shared? So um, I always encourage folks to go in HLC land to go onto our website um, into the substantive change area. And there is a screening tool for contractual arrangements. That would be your first step. Any type of contractual arrangement, academic focus. So this isn't about your food service or garbage handling or things like that. This is really academically focused. Complete that form and send that in. There's no charge for that. And that will allow us to evaluate whether a, a full application is needed or not. Um, if, it, if an application isn't needed and it's a, just a, a small portion of the academic program um, that's under a contractual relationship, we consider that screening form then to be the, the official notification and we put that in the file. But we'll let the institution know either way what needs to be done. Okay, we're gonna take two more questions. This first one, um, can you speak to HLC's place in the triad? Has it changed at all with these new regulations? And what happens if we're found non-compliant in one arena, what happens in the other? That is, how do you share that information? For example, if we're found to be non-compliant with professional licensure regulations um, that don't fall under HLC's areas? So great question. Um, hi, Erica. <laughs> Erica used to be part of our HLC team. So good to see you up on the chat, Erica. Um, what's interesting here is that we are really working to, um, with the triad. We, um, we developed a paper that came out um, back in 2019 about how to change that arrangement with the, uh, arrangement with the triad. A, um, to have better communication and B, to also reduce the burden on institutions. Um, and we're working on that. Uh, in terms of non-compliance, we may find out from one of two ways. One, it may be that the, um, the agency actually sends us a letter indicating that institution has been non-compliant or things like that. Um, we also may receive that from a specialized accrediting body, uh, a programmatic accreditor. Um, or it may be the institution has received that information, um, knows it's non-compliant, and there's a, an assumed practice that the institution would notify us, um, and it's up to the institution to then self-report. Uh, does a change of a program's method of delivery get reported when 50% or more of the curriculum is delivered in a different method? For example, if a program moves some credits online, but not 50% or more, do we need to notify HLC? At this point with these new regulations, my advice to you is notify. Um, you don't want to be on the back end of, of, of realizing a year from now or two years from now at the time of department's program review, that you should have notified and you didn't. So my advice is to notify. Um, and we're just in those beginning months of working with these new policies that we have. Um, and so we're working um, across the office to really make sure that um, we're getting all of those in and, and beginning to get a sense of what institutions are doing and when they really need to notify or when we can provide advice later on to say, this doesn't rise to the level of notification, but we're just in those early stages. Okay, this is our last question. Have you seen changes in state regulations and interpretations based off the change of distinction of regional versus national? For example, in Arizona, institutions who were authorized but by regionally accredited did not have to participate in the student tuition recovery fund, but based off the new um, Department of Education interpretation, they are retroactively applying those funds for the past year and enforcing regionally accredited institutions to pay. Just curious if you've seen this anywhere. I have not seen it anywhere, but I will, um, I can check in the folks in my office in the governmental affairs area to see if they're um, hearing any of this. We work with all 19 of our state agencies on a regular basis. We hold meetings with them a couple times a year. Um, and I can raise this question and ask um, for some um, advice and then send it on to Cheryl. Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. Karen, thank you so much for You're answering welcome. these questions. I appreciate these great questions. Uh, Ricky, I will um, follow up and see if we can get an answer to your question, but we need to, um, to step forward a little bit with our next guest. But Karen, thank you for taking the time to be with You're us welcome. today. Um, this was really important for all of us to hear. I think a lot of questions have come out of these last um, well, out of the negotiated rulemaking and then all the regulations that followed. So certainly the accreditation regulations. So uh, thanks very much. Uh, I know people appreciated. So if we could all clap, we would. Um, so thank, thank you, you very much, Karen. 
Okay, um, we have um, another special guest today that I'm very pleased to introduce, and I'm going to try to turn out this this is whole um, chewing gum and walking at the same time thing that I'm doing here. Um, uh, we're about to, to hear from Bob Shireman, and Bob Shireman is um, he is the Director of Higher Education Excellence and Senior Fellow of the Century Foundation, and he's a witchy commissioner. Uh, Bob is the higher, as I just mentioned, it's uh, and of um, the higher education director of the Century Foundation. If you're not familiar, it's a progressive think tank. He has 30 plus years of higher education poly policy experience. He has launched two nonprofit organizations and worked on two presidential administrations, the Obama and Clinton administration. In 2015, he authored a report titled The Covert for Profit. Um, sounding an alarm about for-profit colleges converting to nonprofit but failing to adopt typical nonprofit financial and conflict of interest norms. Since then, he and his colleagues have monitored the problem and sought policy reforms, including the legislation that he will discuss today. Bob, thank you so much for taking the time to being with us today. And I'm going to share, let you share your screen so that you can share your slides. Fantastic. Thank you Great. so much. Thank you so much for uh, for having me and I appreciated being able to uh, uh, to see Karen's presentation as well. So um, uh, I'm going to um, give the, the the whys and wherefores or the whys and the what's around uh, two states uh, reforms that have been adopted to address the um, the problem of uh, of what we call covert for profit colleges. Um, are you able to see the slides right now? Or yes, see... looks great. Looks great. Okay, great, perfect. Um, so I wanted to give a little bit of background first on um, on what nonprofit means, since many of you are with nonprofit institutions or public institutions. Uh, you know, a fish doesn't really think that much about uh, the role of the water in their life because it's just it's it's all about water. Um, but uh, uh, the for-profit for-profit school lobbyists tend to uh, uh, dismiss nonprofit as being oh that's just tax status and we shouldn't be judged based on based on tax status. But really, it is nonprofit status and it is about the it is core to the integrity of of the institution. And I think it's useful to think of it as a form of accreditation and in fact a a very um, uh, strict and um, and effective one where um, all of the money that is earned at a nonprofit has to be uh, uh, recycled into the um, mission of the organization. Um, all of the business transactions need to be at, uh, in the interest of the organization and not designed to, some, to benefit some, uh, some private party. Um, uh, people ask, you know, well, what about big endowments? Um, well, that the, basically those are fun. The, 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 the reason that a nonprofit has an endowment is in part because they don't have owners who can take the profits. So the, the money sits there until the institution can apply it to its, uh, apply it to, to its mission. Um, uh, and those money managers, uh, yeah, the money managers get paid a lot of money, but they are effect effectively getting paid for their fundraising prowess. S same thing was co with coaches. This gets thrown out there all the time. You know, what about coaches? They get paid a lot of money. Um, you know, Congress has made has, has uh, established a new coach tax, um, but that doesn't change the underlying fundamentals of a nonprofit in terms of um, uh, not being able to distribute those profits to its, uh, to its boards, to, um, to, to private companies. Um, it is the nonprofit status that is the reason for differences that you observe between for-profit colleges and nonprofit colleges. Far fewer incidents of uh, consumer abuses, a greater ingress investment in education instead of marketing, strong generally, stronger jo job outcomes, lower student loan defaults, more aid for low-income students, um, and a great appreciation for the important role, um, the critical role, that central role that faculty play in, uh, in education. Um, the, uh, some states um, and the federal government um, 
uh, recognize those differences and recognize that a for-profit institution has essentially decided um, that they don't want to be subject to the restrictions, um, the regulations that come with being a, um, a nonprofit institution. Um, and so um, there are some federal and some state regulations that apply uh, just to for-profits. Uh, again, some of the for-profit institutions uh, uh, scream that that's somehow unfair, which is disingenuous because they are the ones that are subject to far less regulation because they have chosen not to abide by nonprofit regulations. So, uh, a couple of examples, and these are the state these are the states well where I will uh, that I will be talking about their recently passed laws. Um, uh, California nonprofit accredited schools are exempt from many of their private college regulations uh, in the state um, and uh, out of state institutions uh, uh, delivering education online um, do not have to register with the state if they are nonprofit or public. Um, and then Maryland has a new 9010 law and some other laws uh, and regulations that apply to uh, not public and not nonprofit schools. Um, uh, what has happened, what has led to some of these uh, new laws is uh, that um, for-profit owners uh, like the idea of being labeled nonprofit because they recognize that consumers have become aware that, uh, that for-profit schools have, have a pretty sketchy reputation. Um, and so if they can put a nonprofit label on their school, it, uh, it will help them in their, in their marketing. And we have seen these uh, conversions uh, over the past uh, several years of for-profit schools into, uh, into nonprofits, which, um, <laughs> which still involve some uh, pretty heavy uh, profit making uh, going on. Um, the reason for this is that there has been a marked decline in the IRS oversight of tax exempt organizations. This is a, a chart that shows uh, this is the denial rate of applications for tax exempt status, which is very close to zero. It means basically you can start a nonprofit organization and get IRS tax exempt status uh, rubber stamped. Uh, by, by the IRS these days. We've seen applications that have highly questionable things in them that got okayed anyway. Um, uh, it, it's hard to say exactly what has caused this. Some of the Tea Party controversies contributed to it, um, but it, it is going to be a while before the IRS can, if ever, um, uh, rebuild its, uh, its over, oversight of tax exempt status. So while it used to be that you could kind of say, well, if they're tax exempt, then they probably meet general nonprofit uh, norms, um, you can no longer uh, rely on that. Um, the Century Foundation, um, if you are, if you are um, uh, such a policy geek that you really want to dive into details, we have a lot of reports that we've done about this, about this problem on our website at, at tcf.org. Um, feel free to feel free to dive in, um, uh, but uh, you probably have noticed if you think about it that over the past few years there's been a fair amount of state activity um, and enforcement around nonprofit status. Um, uh, this has been um, uh, this article is about uh, it's not about for about for profit colleges converting, um, but it's about some of the activities around the Trump Foundation, for example, uh, the National Rifle Association uh, in New York, um, and some other uh, state state enforcement. Um, the action that we've seen on uh, covert for profit colleges has occurred in two states. Uh, Maryland uh, enacted a law in 2019 that um, applies to all nonprofit colleges that, uh, that require Maryland authorization, which is uh, any with a physical presence in the state and any out of state college uh, enrolling Maryland residents that is not a member of NC SARA. Um, and for that law, the, the law, uh, the, the review is triggered by 
um, what, what I'm calling here insider transactions that are reported on the IRS tax return. Um, in California, um, uh, California, where I am, uh, we enacted a, a law in, in 2020 last year, um, and it uh, applies, it affects public institutions, um, uh, really the issue here being public institutions that might be educating Californians, either by opening a campus in California. Um, Arizona State University seems very close to doing that in Los Angeles, um, uh, or, um, or uh, uh, enrolling California residents from out of state online, um, or uh, nonprofit conversions. So it is a, um, uh, it applies to, to nonprofits that have converted since, since 2010, in contrast to the Maryland law, which applies to all, uh, all nonprofits. Um, so a um, little bit about the, Merigan, the, the Maryland law, um, which they started, uh, started using uh, this past year. Um, basically, they take uh, some, um, type, some types of transactions that are uh, usually required to be re reported on nonprofit tax returns and the state commission, the state authorizing agency uh, has to do a review if a school has triggered any of those disclosures. Triggering it does not necessarily mean that there's any kind of a problem. It's not that unusual to have some um, some business between uh, between a nonprofit and a, a member of its uh, of, of its board or something like that, but um, the commission has to check it and see if it um, uh, if it goes beyond what is appropriate for a nonprofit organization. Um, this is just a, a sample of of a 990. This is the nonprofit tax return, and you can see that it has some some yes and no questions. Um, that relate to uh, to kind of insider transactions. So this is the sort of thing that would would trigger um, a a check, a review by uh, by the um, uh, the regulator in Maryland. Um, in California, um, uh, this is uh, the the unlike uh, Maryland's law where they did not make any changes to uh, to the question of well, what is a public if it's not just the Maryland run public institutions. Um, California um, uh, addressed this issue mostly, as I said, relates to um, out-of-state um, institutions that might say they're public. A lot of state laws just say public um, uh, in perhaps exempting some schools, but they don't say what they mean by public and what they meant 50 years ago when they passed the law was their own colleges in that state. It didn't occur to them that there would be public institutions from another state. Um, so California uh, continues to acknowledge its own uh, institutions, uh, UC, CSU, uh, or the community colleges. Um, and then a, a public is, is also an institution that's run directly by a, a, government, um, a government itself. In other words, it is not a um, it is not some separate corporation uh, created by it. So, so I, I'm pretty sure this would apply to things like West Point, which is not a separate corporation. It is part, part of the federal government. Um, or uh, an instrumentality, which is, a, which is an IRS uh, word of a state or local government. So it might be a separate, a separate entity um, can be considered a public institution if its employees are government employees, um, if its liabilities are essentially covered by the state to the extent, same extent as the state would cover its own liabilities, and if it is subject to, um, to state financial oversight and public records laws. Um, these might be familiar to those of you who've been following the um, creation, uh, the conversion of Kaplan, for-profit Kaplan University to become Purdue Global, um, a, an instrumentality of, uh, of Purdue University, which is a public uh, institution in Indiana. Um, the state, uh, state legislature exempted that uh, per Purdue Global from its financial oversight, public records, liability, 
uh, laws. So um, Purdue Global under under California's new new law, as uh, as I read it, um, would not be considered a a public institution. Uh, it might still qualify as a as a nonprofit institution. Which brings me to the nonprofit part of this. Um, so beginning in uh, 2022, the, the, the public definition um, takes effect uh, this July. Uh, the, um, the changes regarding nonprofits take effect next January. Um, and um, for those, if an institution has converted, um, it uh, the attorney, the state attorney general uh, goes through a process of reviewing it um, to make sure that uh, the assets were not purchased at an inflated value, um, that it is actually run by the nonprofit, that it's not just a shell corporation that's effectively the for-profit um, company continuing, um, and that if there is a contract with the former owner. Um, and examples uh, would be like Grand Canyon University uh, has a, a essentially endless contract with, um, with Grand Canyon Education, um, the, um, uh, the, the for-profit company that used to directly own Grand Canyon University. Um, so if that contract is for longer than three years, um, it cannot be considered a, a, a nonprofit uh, school for California purposes. Um, and then there was a, a last minute um, uh, amendment that the lobbyist for Ashford University got attached that said that the contract could be longer for three years if the school is, if the formerly for profit school is owned or controlled by a public institution of higher learning. Um, and uh, uh, some of you may know that uh, Ashford University has been acquired by uh, University of Arizona Global Campus, which is affiliated with the University of Arizona. So uh, that little exception there is, um, uh, is aimed at Ashford University. Um, and uh, that is, there, there it is. So I'm happy to... Um, Happy to take questions. That was great, Bob. Thank you so much. I think adding some clarification about what was what was happening in California around um, the new legislation and how that affects uh, nonprofits and what the definitions of these of these specific um, classifications are was really helpful. Um, folks, if you would like to put questions into the chat, um, we'd be happy to um, ask Bob. Um, or if you're willing to put yourself off mute. Um, Charlene, do you have a question? I see you coming off mute. No, I don't. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. We had reported about this, Bob, and so I know some of our folks are, are becoming more familiar with it. Um, so we have a question here. Uh, do you see any other states uh, doing something similar to California in terms of that legislation regarding um, nonprofits? Um, I am not aware of any that are, um, that are, that are kind of uh, emerging um, right now. Um, uh, so no, not at this, not at this point. I wouldn't be surprised frequently when states pass legislation, other, other legislators in other states uh, see, see what happened and um, and they start looking into it, but um, but not aware of anything now. Um, let's see, you mentioned something about online in California. Uh, I was wondering if you might be able to elaborate on that. Um, so if, uh, if an out of state school without a physical, if you have a physical presence in California, then, then you need to register unless, uh, unless your school is, uh, exempt. Um, and those exemptions would, would depend on these definitions that I just described. If you do not have a physical presence in California, um, then you are, um, then there are registration requirements in the state. Um, essentially, uh, it's, a, it's a form of state authorization with uh, fewer of the state's regulations applying. 
um, but it uh, it requires a set of you requires you to agree to a set of reporting requirements where, for example, if there's a law enforcement action or if you have an accreditation issue, those need to be reported to the state. The state can investigate and can um, de-recognize you based on uh, based on those. So so it is. Um, it, it applies state California's state authorization to um, uh, uh, out-of-state schools enrolling any in-state students, um, but um, uh, but uh, at a somewhat in, in a in a in a different sort of way. And generally, publics and nonprofits are uh, exempt from that requirement. Um, uh, unless they don't, unless they're a conversion that doesn't meet that nonprofit rule starting next year, or if they're a public that does not meet that public definition. Uh, we've, we've had a couple of folks asking um, if we could have access to your slides. Would you be willing to send me? Yes. Okay, thank you. And, and Karen's sure. willing to do the same. She'll send yeah. a handout. And I'll send, I will send links to the two laws as well so that Super. that's uh, clear. Great. Um, I think, uh, let's see, we have another question. So I wonder if you could explain what protections are there for students located in California who enroll in institutions that are outside of California that are either nonprofit or public? What would be the protections? Um, they, yeah, they are essentially, um, uh, and I haven't memorized all of this, but um, uh, there is some STRIF requirement um, and um, I think that's right. I should double check that. But mostly it's about the reporting. So mostly mostly it's a requirement of um, that the school needs to report to the state agency that there's a um, uh, like a law enforcement action. Um, basically, they need to report any signs of trouble signs of trouble um, that uh, that the state can then um, look into and. at students. Sorry, I don't remember all of uh, whether there's some strict requirements or not. So this is so this is where you're you're talking about your um, attorney general's office getting in, involved if there's an issue. Um, yes, it could be the att attorney the general's students. office or or just this this state authorizer. The AG is involved in the review of conversions. Um, uh, not necessarily involved in, um, you know, in reviewing, but, you know, obviously if it's a law enforcement issue, there's a good chance that, that the, um, the agency here would check in with the, um, with the AG. Okay, well, uh, okay, one last question. Um, Bob, you mentioned California using the IRS from 1990 to identify financial practices that might mark a questionable nonprofit school. Are there other ways to identify such higher education institutions? Um, suggestion form um, I-990. Right, yeah, so that the, um, I know there was a typo uh, <laughs> there. So yes, the IRS form 990 is actually used by Maryland um, uh, and uh, basically um, uh, mimics some of the specific questions on the IRS 990 form that says if you have a, re a reportable item that is, for example, something called an excess benefit transaction, which is basically a, 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 a profit um, transaction at the nonprofit, or um, if your board members are um, uh, have business transactions. So basically, if there is a if there's a yes on any of those check boxes, um, that, that triggers a uh, a deeper review to make sure that it's um, uh, that it that it does not constitute private inurement or basically profiteering off of off of a nonprofit. Um, uh, the downside of the Maryland approach is that those check boxes don't cover everything, um, and in particular some of the contractual arrangements that can um, seriously uh, undermine 
um, nonprofit governance are uh, necessarily lead to um, those those check boxes. So um, I think some of the um, so uh, my my recommendation if a, if a state were to try to do more uh, to kind of build on what what we've learned from the California and, and Maryland laws would be to make sure to take that and to, to expand on that a little bit in terms of um, triggering uh, triggering a review. Well, thank you so much, Bob, for taking the time to be with us today and, and talk about um, all of this and, and diving deep into it to help our folks understand um, the, um, the nuances. So thank you again. And thank you, Karen. Uh, we've had two wonderful special guests today, and we still have more special guests to come. We have um, Dan and I took our own advice and we invited our senior leaders uh, to uh, be on the call today with us. We have uh, Russ Poulin. Who, uh, Russ, am I sh sharing your slides or are you sharing your slides? Which would you like to do? I can try sharing here. Let's see. Okay. So while Russ is getting set up, um, you know, Russ Poulin is the executive director for WCET, for which SAN is a part of. And uh, I'm really uh, pleased that Demi Mikalau was able to uh, take the time to be with us today. There she is waving. Thank you, Demi, uh, for being with us today. And uh, Russ is going to talk a little bit about what the relationship is. You know, we have all of these, we, we've called it alphabet soup of acronyms um, between WCET and we've got our parent organization, WICHE and then where sand fits in. So we're going to let Russ uh, explain that to all of us, um, you know, at this point. So Russ, thanks so much for putting these visuals together so that we can uh, talk about this. Yes, Cheryl, and I, I understand we're near the top of the hour because we had such great content. I want to thank uh, uh, Karen and Bob for, for what they presented today. And so uh, this will be quick and no one will be tested on this information. So you don't have to worry about worry about that. Uh, so there's all these organizations that are involved and our parent organization, uh, and, and thank you, President uh, Mikalau, for being on here today, that uh, the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education does, was started in the 50s and does actually focus on the Western states, as you see there, um, including the, the one thing that's not Hawaii that you see out there is the Marianas Islands and Guam uh, that were, uh, have expanded out there. But they started back in the 50s with uh, student exchange programs, the idea that uh, uh, not every state had professional programs in uh, veterinary medicine or medical colleges and all these in all the states and that they uh, had exchanges across the, the states and that expanded from professional programs to graduate programs to uh, undergraduate programs where there's you know, thousands and thousands of students who take advantage of that each year. Uh, which is one of uh, four regional higher education compacts, one in the uh, South, which was the first one, one in uh, New England, which was the, uh, it's in there, and in MEC, which was in the Midwest, which was the last one. Uh, beyond student exchange, that these uh, regional compacts focus on uh, policy and research uh, issues uh, for the states in higher education, and which he has a uh, behavioral health unit, uh, which is uh, something that uh, is interesting. Uh, to have. And then uh, back in 1989, uh, which he started what is now called the Wichi Cooperative for Educational Technologies. Uh, it also was focused on the West until the first day we started. And people from Oklahoma came in and said, we need to be broader than that. And so now we have uh, uh, members in all 50 states. We focus on uh, online distance learning, digital learning, uh, whether it's online or on campus that we're looking at the use of uh, technologies and are really uh, focused on the uh, effect sharing effective practices uh, and also we're very deep we're probably the organization that's deepest in the uh, policy areas that you've seen uh, such as we're uh, covered today and then trying to help you uh, understand state federal uh, compliance uh, accreditation uh, rules and then also uh, what are others doing in terms of institutional policies and so uh, we have expanded out and we'll see there uh, we're across that, that in membership is by institution, uh, nonprofit agencies, state agencies, accrediting agencies. Glad to have uh, uh, Karen was on our uh, steering committee and our executive council for several years. And then uh, finally here that we have uh, uh, 10 years ago that we started uh, the state authorization network. This came out of uh, after the uh, federal regulation was released in uh, uh, I, put, I put in 1991, oh, that's a lot older. That's not quite right. Uh, so that's 
Oh, uh, and he makes slides. So 10 years ago that, the, that, that this was founded, the State Authorization Network, uh, that we started it because we were finding out that uh, state authorization rules were difficult and that by uh, uh, people at institutions sharing what they were doing to stay in compliance and also bringing in experts who knew about compliance from federal uh, and state uh, uh, levels uh, that they could help institutions to figure out how to stay in compliance with uh, state authorization rules. And the very last thing that I have here uh, is that uh, uh, SAN is a, a sort of a sub-membership of WCT so that while uh, you may be a WCT member that WC SAN membership allows for organizations like systems to join. And so while your system may join and that allows all of your institutions to be part of SAN, it may not mean that you're also a WCT member. So you'd have to uh, uh, look into that. With that, I tried to go through that very fast, Cheryl, and we'll turn it over to you to finish. Did great. Here. Friends don't tell friends that, that uh, 2020 was more than 20 years ago. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> thanks very much for explaining all of that, Russ. And I'll just real quickly want to just thank everyone for being here today. It was wonderful to have special guests that were presenters, special guests that were just joining us, um, you know, to see the flow of our meetings. I hope you uh, gained something new about what the State Authorization Network does for your institution or your agency. So thanks very much. Um, the recording and the transcript and uh, slides will all be on the SAN website by at the latest Mon uh, Friday. So I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thanks again, and we'll be talking with you soon. Bye-bye.